5G is here, except maybe it isn't, and carriers don't agree on what it actually is. One thing is certain though, your phone will get faster unless it doesn't, for now. Let's dive in. Welcome to Upskilled, our explainer show where we break down the tech that is making your gadgets better. Today, I wanna to talk about 5G, a new set of wireless technologies that promise blazingly fast data connections to your phone. Right now, with the right phone in the right city, you can get download speeds of over one gigabit per second, which is 20 to 30 times faster than typical 4G LTE. But the key part there is right phone and right city. 5G isn't remotely widespread, and the array of technologies that make it up are still kind of a mess. And array of technology is key because 5G isn't one thing. It's a collection of various improvements, including antenna design, cell towers, and a wider set of radio spectrum, and it's still unclear which changes there will make the most difference. With different carriers focusing on different tech, your experience of 5G may also vary widely. So when it comes to 5G, what's the good, the bad, and the realistic? But first, let's answer a basic question. What actually is a cell network? Well, a cell phone is so named because the networks are divided up into chunks, like cells in a honeycomb. Let's imagine for a second a fictional early cell network. Your phone would connect with a tower via a specific radio frequency, like a slice of the available spectrum, and each tower has a limit to the number of people who can connect to it, one for each slice. So to get more customers, cell companies set up more towers and have those towers broadcast as many frequencies or channels as they can. But here's where it gets tricky. If you have two towers next to each other using the same set of frequencies, it actually limits the number of people who can use them. Because if two people are trying to connect on the same channel using the same slice, you could end up with interference or you might even pick up a stranger's call. So you make towers near each other use different slices of the spectrum, but you only have so many slices to work with and you wanna be able to have as many people as possible on your network. So for towers that are far enough away, you can reuse some of that spectrum without worrying about overlap. So you wanna maximize the channels per tower to serve the most people with the least towers, but with enough physical distance between towers with the same channel so you don't get interference. And in the end, you get a cell pattern. These days, most towers, also called base stations, are triangular and broadcast a different set of channels in each of the three directions to maximize coverage with the fewest possible towers. And this is part of what makes a cell network so flexible. Smaller, shorter range towers close together can boost capacity in a dense city, while larger, more spaced out towers can cover rural areas. Most cell technology has been about getting those slices of spectrum to encode more and more data and getting more people connected to each tower at once. Early cell towers might only have supported at most a dozen people making analog voice calls, but modern networks use tricks like time sharing and advanced encoding and modulation to support hundreds or even thousands of people all streaming Netflix and Verizon Facebook. So how will 5G improve all this? Well, the change isn't really a hardware one, but 5G uses a much broader range of the EM spectrum and dedicates more bandwidth to those channels, i.e. it gives people bigger slices. Traditional cell signals have mostly fallen between 500 and 2500 megahertz frequency on the EM spectrum, but 5G can use frequencies up to 20 times higher than that. The official 5G NR, or new radio, spec breaks into two chunks. FR1, which covers around 400 to 6,000 megahertz, and FR2, which is about 24 to 50 gigahertz, the much hyped millimeter wave, which we will return to shortly. When we spoke to Qualcomm, who make the chips that power most Android phones, including cellular modems, they said in practical usage, the sub six gigahertz spectrum should be thought of as two chunks that behave very differently, under 1,000 and over 2,500 megahertz. Quick refresher, cell signals are an electromagnetic wave, just like light or radio waves, and hertz is the frequency, or the number of peaks and valleys that wave carries per second. Lower frequencies are easier to transmit longer distances, they can wrap around or pass through most objects. Think of sound waves, you can hear the bass from your neighbor's stereo, but the high frequency, the treble, gets absorbed before it reaches you. For just this reason, some companies like T-Mobile and AT&T in the US have been rolling out so-called low-band 5G networks at 600 and 850 megahertz. These have great coverage and require relatively few towers as a result, but they come with a big drawback. At these low frequencies, there just isn't much bandwidth and the speeds are a lot slower. Think of bandwidth as how big a slice of the spectrum you can connect with. At low frequencies, there just isn't all that much spectrum to slice up. 
there just isn't a huge range of options between 600 and 1000 megahertz. So channels tend to be small, like 10 or 20 megahertz. Small slices, thus slower speeds. In some cases, not actually that much faster than 4G. Because of this, most providers around the world are actually focusing instead on the mid-band, which currently runs between more or less 2500 and 4700 megahertz, but may extend up to 7000 later. This is higher frequency than most current cell systems, and it will probably require some more towers to get the same coverage, but it has a lot more available spectrum. Channels can be between 50 or 100 megahertz of bandwidth, enabling much higher data speeds, maybe hundreds of megabits. Aside from Sprint, the US carriers are largely ignoring the mid-band for now, and instead focusing on that high-end, the millimeter wave between 24 and 50 gigahertz. There is a lot of available spectrum here, enabling channels as wide as 800 megahertz, but it comes with some big drawbacks. Before we get to those, let's talk about what's changed in the actual tech. In terms of how the signal is modulated or encoded to hold data, not actually a lot. Cell signals use something called QAM, or Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, which twists the sine wave of the signal into shapes that get decoded into collections of ones and zeros. 4QAM has four shapes that correspond to 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. 16QAM has 16 shapes decoding to 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1, and you get the idea. The more complex the modulation, the more data you can pack in, but the stronger a signal you need to be able to read and decipher it. And your phone and the tower will scale up or down the QAM depending on your reception. In an ideal world, right next to a brand new LTE cell tower, you could conceivably communicate at 256 QAM, where each chunk sends eight 001s. With all this, it may surprise you to learn that 5G signals are currently maxing out at 64 QAM. We learned from Qualcomm that the generally weaker signals and higher frequencies of 5G meant maintaining signal strength was paramount, so in general they toned down this encoding. This means the speed boost of 5G is really due to those wider channels and more frequency and not to heavily modulated signals. The even more complex 1024 QAM may still be coming someday, but our Qualcomm contact said it'll be years before it even makes it out of the lab. To get the most out of those high bandwidth data channels, they've actually been paired with a new technology called Mass MIMO, which stands for Multiple Input, Multiple Output. Traditional 4G towers generally had between 4 and 32 antennas, and in good conditions, your phone may actually be able to communicate with more than a single antenna at once, boosting the amount of data it can send or receive. Most high-end phones currently support 4x4 MIMO, meaning they can have four active connections to a tower. This is definitely a best case scenario though. Many phones are actually still two by two, and even if your phone supports four connections, it's not a guarantee the cell tower can supply them all. A massive MIMO base station will have between 64 and 256 separate antennas, and a 5G phone should be able to achieve eight or even 16 connections, which are called layers, with the base station, increasing speed even more. Millimeter Wave actually has enough channel bandwidth that only 2x2 or 4x4 MIMO is needed for that part of the spectrum, but for the mid or low band connections, massive MIMO should be a big boost. Now, this does actually require phone makers to produce a device with a dozen or more antennas, which will add cost, use battery life, and may run into physical constraints, i.e. that is a lot of antennas to cram into a phone. But the tech should mature and get cheaper over time. One advantage of this massive MIMO design is it can also take advantage of beamforming, which is a technique for directing signals to the device that actually needs it. It's not like the antennas are actually being steered to point at your phone, but by using an array of antennas, you can take advantage of some clever physics. A cell antenna broadcasts in all directions, though they're frequently mounted on panels these days, so they really just broadcast in 180 degrees. But if you broadcast the same signal from two antennas near each other, there will be places where their signals intersect and overlap that will be stronger than the signal either individual antenna can generate. By grouping even more antennas together, you can reinforce this effect, creating a beam where all the waves from each antenna arrive at once. By shifting the phase of the antennas, essentially the timing of the waves they're making, you can actually bend and direct this beam. The tower will measure the signal from your phone and all of the reflections from the signal bouncing off buildings and terrain, and it can use it to help determine your direction, and it will aim its reply in the right spot. So it's not really like a laser or even a flashlight, but by combining the signals from multiple weak antennas, you can create a directed signal made from the overlap of their broadcasts. According to Qualcomm, this lets mid-band signals from a 5G tower travel nearly as far as 4G LTE currently does, despite being higher frequency, and it lets each tower support more users. 
It's also crucial to millimeter wave, which has other challenges to overcome. Remember, higher frequency signals are more easily absorbed, and millimeter wave has small enough wavelength it'll be blocked by just about everything. Trees, walls, even energy efficient glass will block these signals, and so will your skin, which is great for folks who are worried about the cancer potential of radio waves, but not great for, say, holding your phone. Even the air actually blocks millimeter waves, and rain and fog can potentially degrade the signal to the extent where the maximum range of a 5G millimeter wave tower will probably be under a kilometer. Millimeter wave does have the potential to be crazy fast, but the physics means it's unlikely to ever scale outside dense urban centers. Outdoors, we would likely need towers every few hundred meters, and indoors, maybe every 50 meters. Still, indoors may actually end up being the best case scenario for this tech using small cells throughout malls, airports, office buildings, and stadiums to essentially replace Wi-Fi with a super fast network your phone would automatically recognize and connect to. Whereas T-Mobile and Sprint have gone all in on low frequency 5G, Verizon has really focused on millimeter wave with mixed results. Speeds have been impressive, as high as a gigabit per second, but early testers have complained about actually being able to find a signal. What's odd is in general, the US companies are ignoring that mid-band. This is where most 5G networks globally are actually being built. And while it probably won't enable multi-gigabit speeds, the mid-band should enable data rates in the hundreds of megabits and do so without the range penalty of millimeter wave. So what could you do with speeds like this? Well, for starters, media streaming will get a lot faster. In fact, you could probably stream just about anything. Super fast speeds like this could lead to nearly storage-less devices, where all your files and media are instantly retrievable. Or imagine a camera with no memory card that just beams 4K video straight into the cloud. In a best case scenario, it also makes wired internet functionally obsolete. And part of the 5G plan is a convergence with Wi-Fi, where your internet and your cell network become the same thing. There's also huge potential in less exciting realms like infrastructure and manufacturing and research, opening up the possibility of high resolution sensors that can beam huge amounts of data in real time to servers for analysis, helping a network of machines and automated systems adjust to changing conditions. A lot of things would also benefit from another advantage of 5G, lower latency. 5G claims to be able to drop the delay for a phone communicating to a cell tower to as low as one millisecond, down from 20 to 70 milliseconds for LTE. Now this is probably years away in reality, but it could help with mobile gaming, especially as services like Stadia and xCloud and Nvidia Live are now talking about streaming games directly to your phone. These data speeds are also probably a requirement for true automotive automation, with self-driving cars receiving data from sensors at stoplights and intersections and sharing their position and intentions with the cars around them, and maybe even with a central municipal computer that can help to reduce traffic and deploy emergency vehicles in monitor conditions. This all sounds pretty amazing, but if you've watched this show before, you know I need to inject some skepticism here. First off, these companies can talk all they want about multi-gigabit speeds, but those one gigabit speeds people are getting right now on 5G? That's how fast 4G was supposed to be when the standard was first set. But the average LTE speed in the US is still only between 16 and 30 megabits per second, a fraction of its potential. The networks we are seeing right now in 5G are essentially prototypes, and while companies will keep building out capacity, there's also almost no phones on those networks right now, and it's hard to know how fast they'll actually be once there are more 5G phones out there. Because of course, your current phone probably doesn't support any of this tech, and new 5G phones are currently pretty pricey. In the rest of the world, the mid-band 5G does seem to have more potential. It avoids the range issues of millimeter wave while still potentially boosting speeds. Mobile has already leapfrogged broadband in a lot of countries, and faster wireless speeds could help a lot of people get connected. But on the other hand, I would argue that data caps and expensive plans are probably a bigger impediment for people relying on mobile to get online than the fact that they can't currently download a whole Blu-ray in three seconds. The big investment in 5G is also currently centered on cities, places that traditionally have had pretty decent access to the internet already. For now, some carriers are also restricting 5G speeds to their most expensive plans. And in the US, AT&T has even floated the possibility of a tiered system where you would need to pay extra to get full speed. So what 
do you folks think? Are you excited for 5G? For me, if a company were to offer a 5G connection that was cheaper than my cable and faster and didn't have a data cap and my phone and laptop and PC could all share a connection, I could see myself getting excited. What would you do with these speeds? And are you rushing out to buy a new 5G phone? Also, if you're curious, we were thinking about putting together a piece on the history of the Gs one through four or how 5G might screw up weather satellites. If those sound interesting, let us know in the comments and be sure to like and subscribe. We'll catch you next time.